Mr. Baba is here, the founder of Muse Muscle uh, Method. Mr. Baba, hi, thank you for joining oh, us. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so, I'm sorry for the, the uh, funny start with the connection, but we all know with the uh, Instagram Live, sometimes we're very lucky and sometimes we're not. Yes. Uh, Is my uh, picture good now? Just let me know. Yes, it's perfect. It's perfect. Oh, and oh, maybe we should, should, I should wait. We should wait just a, like a moment so people log on again. Yes, the, the, uh, the audiences are joining us. Uh, I think we can start. And okay. It's the first. This is the join. Okay. 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 So I'll just say again, just apologies for the beginning, but thank you guys for your understanding with um, the connection of uh, Instagram. And uh, what I want to say again is uh, salam to everybody and uh, hello to everybody. I try to go in between my, uh, thank you so much for the welcome. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so I want to say um, I really appreciate you guys having me on and I would love to talk to you about myself. Um, there's Ani. Um, and uh, so I was going to say that I want to talk a little bit about myself and uh, what I do. I'm actually a violist. I'm based in New York City. And um, I've actually was born in the United States, lived in Canada, came back in um, Vancouver, actually, and then came back to the States. And I was, uh, I went to, um, as a violist, I went to high school in Long Island, and um, where there's a huge Persian community. And, um, and then I went to, I commuted to New York City, and I went to pre-college at the Juilliard School. And then I ended up getting my mas bachelor's and my master's. So two degrees. So I was basically at Juilliard since I was 14 till 24. But what happened was I started developing a lot of um, issues playing and I could never understood why. And I did have a teacher in the high school division that said, listen, she tried Alexander Technique and it helped her. And I thought, okay, let me go to the Alexander Technique. And I thought, what is this Alexander Technique? I never thought much about anything. I didn't hear anything because as we all know, I'm assuming that the most of our audiences are um, um, musicians or artists on some level, but we're, yeah. never taught, we're never taught about the body. We're never taught about self care. So I used to be, I was, a, I was very big in high school. I was 120 kilos and when I, and I lost 60 kilos. So no, life after 21, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and, you know, I'm like, oh my God, I gained, I gained some weight on this pandemia, as my mother says, pandemia. So, um, so. The time um, that you told me about your previous weight, I was shocked, you know. Yeah, yeah I was yeah. 60. That's yeah, unbelievable. I, I cut 60, and I'm very lucky. I don't have any extra skin or anything like that. So, thank God. So, so with that, I, um, you know, I was very unhealthy. I never thought about myself. I never did exercise. I never thought about food. I am actually Mediterranean from the Middle East and Southern Europe. So that's my family. And then they went to uh, South America and Caribbean and all that. So that's the Lebanese side. So they, you know, they, the Lebanese travel, like, you know, all over the place. <laughs> but uh, so I actually took care. I, because of Alexander Technique, something woke up inside of me. And this, I was about 16 when I came to the Alexander Technique because I actually had problems with my shoulders. Now, the funny part is, I'm sure that all of you can understand that if you have a talent on the inside and you do well on the outside, like, you know, from, I'm going to give you an example about myself. I used to play first chair, the first seat in the viola, in the, in the, in the orchestra, in the youth orchestra, in the, uh, you know, all these different things. And I was doing well. But on the inside, something was going on. And when I learned the Alexander Technique, which is, it is, um, I'm going to give an academic, because most people would say, what is this Alexander Technique? And what I like to talk about, because I teach it now that I'm certified, I always say the Alexander Technique is a re-education of your posture through movement and breathing. So that makes it a little bit more um, concrete, because what I say is, um, when you have someone putting hands on, giving you verbal instructions, it feels very, there's, it's, um, it, there's nothing to hold on to. But when you start doing academics, I think it, uh, implying, uh, acad um, applying ac academics, it makes it a little bit more concrete for uh, one to understand. And it really is a re-education of your posture through movement and breathing. The interesting thing about this, it is a, um, 
it is a self-help type of work. It is not a self-taught. That's the only difference. Like if you take yoga, Tai Chi, Feldenkrais, any of these self-help type of uh, things that help you alleviate any pain, then um, the difference is with the Alexander Technique, you can only do it with an Alexander teacher. This also falls into the category of a very fancy word I like to say is uh, somatics. And somatics is the study of human movement, very much like with Hamed is like doing with the moose mu mu muscle uh, music. Me so, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's very much the same. It's this, it falls into the category of somatics. And it's, very, it's the study of human movement. And it's wonderful uh, of inner freedom, let's just say, that we're uh, achieving for. Um, now, when it comes to, well, through my whole journey, I, you know, I, was taking Alexander Technique lessons privately as, as I was a student. And by the time I graduated my master's degree at Juilliard, I actually had to come to a fork in the road because I was also, I was in the Sejong Soloist. It's a very small chamber group. Um, it was bigger when I graduated. Now it's reduced because of many reasons of classical music in uh, uh, the United States. But I, um, I was, I had gotten into that. I was sub starting to substitute in like New York City Ballet and the Orchestra of St. Luke's and Lincoln, you know, all these Lincolns. And then I was young, but I, I said to myself, which was very unusual for a conservatory graduate to say, something's wrong, I need to fix it, but it goes beyond me. I said, my teacher used to tell me I had to learn how to teach. And I said, I don't know how to teach. I went to conservatory. I didn't get a music education degree. And what I thought, instead of going back to four years of school to get an education degree, I, I said, let me get my Alexander degree. And I did it and I healed myself because I didn't realize how much pain I was in on a physical level. Um, even psychologically, mentally, there was so many things that I became, you know, I became a vegetarian. My parents think I'm crazy. They say Eddie, Eddie has a problem <laughs> whenever we have family gatherings. Um, and you can imagine Southern European, Middle, Middle Eastern, parents they're not uh you know they don't understand vegetarian but i became a vegetarian i and i be, took a lot of yoga a lot of yoga um i i love it i exercise pilates all these different things but never really a runner because of the knees and everything but regardless i lost weight i changed my attitude i freed myself up on so many things and so after this particular education that I got with the Alexander Technique, guess what I did? I got another certification for teaching the Suzuki Violin Viola Method. And I'm just gonna give you a quick introduction of what the Suzuki Method is. Um, it actually comes from devastation into something that's beautiful. There was a man, uh, I can't pronounce his first name, but his last name was Dr. Suzuki. He was a, a doctor, PhD person. And he studied in Berlin in the 1920s and 30s or something. But he was from Japan. Um, very interesting because his wife was German um, and was a wonderful thing. But I mean, this is, this is a little bit of a sad point that um, it was after World War II. And he saw the country was devastated, absolutely devastated. But from an educational point of view, he was saying to, uh, asking the, a very simple question. He said, in education, and I'm sure it exists in Iran, I'm sure it exists all over the world, like, you know, how you go to school and you have grammar school and you have middle school and high school, and you start to have these tests and you say, who's, who's smarter, who's not as smart? But Dr. Suzuki was of the bent of mind. He said, well, okay, if someone's faster in math and someone's faster in science, whatever or something, but how come all children speak Japanese? That was his question. That was the deepness of the, that's a deep thinking. If you think about it, he said, if someone was smart with certain things, but how come that everybody can speak the same language? And that's what the Suzuki violin and viola method is. Um, so it's a really cool thing because uh, now it's like the standardized thing. Yes, you know, with every method, there's flaws and positive things that go with it. But from an educational point of view, I'm in love with the teaching. You can teach from four years old. It's a, um, also the parent has to work with the child. So that was also another uh, push for this kind of method because it bonds the parent and the child that they can work together and do projects together, which is a beautiful thing. Um, and that's the basic, I am, listen, this, um, the Suzuki um, uh, method is like rather large, but I mean, I just wanted to give you that, but it gave me the tools to how to work from kids, 
How do you hold the bow? How do you hold the instrument? What is the setup? My big thing, by the way, from the Alexander technique, why I was having a lot of issues on my shoulder region is because my chin rest and shoulder rest were not correct. Um, we, my teachers, we tried all these different things, but it never was correct. Um, I'm not tall. I'm not short. I'm, you know, I have a uh, normal neck. You know, I don't have anything too thick, but not thin. So we couldn't figure it out. And my shoulder was kept on. I was using the wrong shoulder rest. Um, unfortunately, I have my instrument away. I, I would have shown you guys um, what I'm talking about. But so what I learned from the Alexander technique is, you know, I needed to understand that my spine was long. I, oh, I can tell you, I'm, I would love to even give you a whole thing about the Alexander Technique. Inclusiveness um, with body mapping. So please forgive me if I seem like my, my um, subjects are going all over the place, but I'm very excited to share all this information with you. But Don't worry, I, I'm uh, writing some you know, uh, good points and I'm gonna ask you uh, these points after you are done, okay? Don't worry, oh, just let okay. us know more about it. Okay, okay, good, thank you, thank you. Um, merci. Um, but I, what I can say is that, that that's why that's my trajectory of my life about getting Alex, my bachelor's and my master's from performance at Juilliard. And I got my Alexander degree and then I got my Suzuki certification. And then I was young, 20s, and I said, now what do I do? And I just started my journey of actually um, combining well-being. Uh, that's my approach. Uh, it's actually a little bit selfish on my end because I actually... The Alexander Technique makes you feel good without having to do anything. And um, I'll explain that as I go a little bit further when we talk about the Alexander Technique and body mapping for people who don't know about it. And hopefully for those of you who do know about it, this is somewhat of a review. But when I'm talking about like I felt better, I was like, you know, I, I was you know young and then I was like, okay, I'm going to teach kids I'm going to, I was very lucky I got to teach at New York University teaching Alexander Technique in the music department at Steinhardt. And then I'm still playing. I play on Broadway. I play um, in Lincoln Center. I substitute with the ballet. I, I play in the Orchestra of St. Luke still. And I do other musical projects. Um, and I'm not saying this to pat myself on the shoulder. It's I'm showing you, I'm going to give one thing that made my motivation happen. I'm positive that every single one of you have heard of a tragic story, somebody um, that had an accident. So I'm gonna give you an example. My teacher at Juilliard, when he was young, he was a prodigy. And he was cleaning a gun, he was from Austria, like something, and like, he's cleaning a gun and the, uh, the thing exploded in his hand. And he was, a, he was a prodigy and the doctor said, you will never play again. Now, fast forward, he was the principal violist of the New York Philharmonic. So he defied what doctors said. And I think that if you look at it on a medical plane that so many of us have overcome cancer, uh, car accidents, you know, rehabilitation of sorts. So it's the power of the mind. And that was something that was motivated for myself because I knew those stories, not only with my teacher, but with other medical miracles as we would call them. And I rehabilitate, I mean, liter literally, when you think about the psychological impact, when you're a teenager or even younger, and you're, and as, when I was 14, 15 years old, I knew I wanted to be a musician. I said, I want to be a musician. And my parents thought, what? Because, you know, like I didn't go to a doctor or, you know, my mother's business with the real estate and all these things. And they were like shocked. And they were like, my, their son is a, uh, crazy, you know, and I was like, I'm American, you know, that's what I would always say. <laughs> it was the arguments that I was like, I was like, no, we're different, you know, it was like the fun, funny, funny thing. But um, I was determined to make myself, because I put so much energy and, you know, I didn't do the typical teenage things. I, um, you know, so there's a psychological element as well that I said, I wanted, you know, I gave up my weekends and I was in pre-college and youth orchestra on Sundays. And I, that's what I wanted to do. And this is my life that I want to be in. I just, you know, make, make music, make, you know, have love in the world and peace and all these things. It's not, it's not about anything other than that. So that was my determination. But you know something that was really funny? And this is where I want to talk to you about Mr. Alexander. I'll just give you two seconds of his background. He was born in 1869 and he died in 1955. And where he was born is very interesting. He was born in Northwest Winyard, 
on the island of Tasmania, in that heart-shaped island south of Australia. And he died in London, England, a very wealthy man, by the way, uh, 1955. And he was a Shakespeare, he was a fancy word. I like to say the fancy word. It's, he was a monologist, meaning he was a Shakespearean actor. And the very long story short, he actually, oftentimes while he was reciting, he would either become very hoarse or in one particular instance, completely lost his voice. And it, this is one particular instance in front of a packed house of all these talent agents ready to hire him and he lost his voice. This devastated him. His technique came out of his actual de uh, depression. He went through a severe depression. There's very well written, documented, all these things. And there, this is where we now talk about the Alexander Technique because remember 1869, 1955, it was before microphones, computers or anything. It took him uh, nine years to discover this. And he, what he started with was uh, awareness and observation. So the thing is when I usually talk about the Alexander Technique and body mapping, um, I use, you know, Hamid and I, we've been very luck lucky that I can be screen sharing, but unfortunately I can't screen share on the Instagram live because I like to use images. Images are a wonderful teaching tool that really, they do, you, you, re, re, tra, uh, you retain, sorry, uh, you retain the information much deeper than just words, if that makes any sense. But the, I'm gonna do the best I can without my bones or images or anything like that of that sort. I will now talk to you really fast about body mapping. Body mapping was developed by two Alexander teachers. And they recognized that, and they're very much alive, actually. They're in their late 70s. Um, they recognized working with students because, all right, you have um, people coming in and out of the chair or lying down on the table. And people, let, they realized that people move in the way they believe they're designed to move. And what they did was break it down from an anatomical point. Now, this is not an anatomy class, but they're asking you, to draw, where's the top of your spine? Where's your hip joints? How, what are your arms comprised of? How many joints are the arm? What about your legs? What about your arches of the feet? How many arches do you actually have in your feet? And that was, it was just basic questions for the students to start drawing and starting to actually um, discover and correct their map. That's what we um, talk about with body mapping. So in the Alexander Technique, we always say body mapping is the driver's ed of the Alexander Technique. It's really an academic approach, still with the, the whole thing about um, the principles of Alex, Mr. Alexander's Technique. But I, I figured if I can just do one little exercise with you guys, because I know what I'm, I'm giving you a lot of information and it's a lot of talking that I'm doing right now. And I just figured, let me talk to you about an experience. So right now, what, what I wanna to talk to you about is, you know how we have the, you can easily name five senses, like touch, smell, you know, taste, you know, you know, the five senses. What is, I find astounding because in the medical community, even when Alexander was alive, he was the one that highlighted, he didn't discover it. He highlighted it. He said, we have another sense. And the, and the medical community said, yes, we do. Um, by the way, side note, depending on who you speak to, they say we have 32 senses. And it's like, well, we're not going there right now. What I'm interested in talking about is the sixth sense. And I'm just gonna introduce this idea to you. We're just gonna do a couple of things. Also, if you guys can have a piece of paper or a pencil and a, a paper next to you on, on a desktop or a book, we'll do that in a moment. But what I wanna talk to you about is the kinesthetic sense. And this is just an one element of an experience from uh, body mapping slash Alexander Technique experience, uh, you know, because you take lessons and all these different things. So mo uh, we have the kinesthetic sense, it's the sixth sense, and I'm going to demonstrate something to you right now. And I'm going to, and then I'm going to ask you to do the same thing in a moment. I'm going to close my eyes and just to show you how I'm pointing my finger to the nose. And then if I point my finger up to the ceiling, I can bring my finger to the nose without having to look. The same thing if I was pointing to the other side, to my left, back to the nose. I'm gonna ask you guys to play around with that just for one moment, and I'm gonna lead you through that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to you. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes, and you're gonna point your finger to the nose. 
point of uh, view. Would you please give me a moment to translate this one into Persian? Of course, of course. Of course. دوستان ادیه تمرین واسه کینستیک سنس میخواد بده کینستیک سنس چیزی که در واقع ما حرکت همون روش بنا میشه حس شیشومی که اضافه شده به حس های پنجگانه الان ادیه ازتون میخواد که توی جهت های مختلف دستتون بیارید به سمت بینیتون در حالی که چشمتون بسته است یعنی ما سنس بینایی رو میخوایم احساس بینایی کلن میخوایم از دست بدیم و ادیه میخواد به اون نشون بده که Merci, merci. So what I'm going to ask you to do is close your eyes and point your finger onto the nose. And then I'm going to ask you to point your finger up to the um, ceiling. And then bring your finger back to the nose. Notice how you don't need your eyes. I'm going to ask you to point your finger to the right side of you. Take your finger out to the side. And then point your finger back to the nose. And again, notice that you don't need to look at your finger. Now go to the left and bring your finger back to the nose. You can gently open your eyes. You can open your eyes and you can see that you didn't need to use your eyes to bring this sensation. It's a sensation yeah. for your kinesthetic sense. You, you didn't need the eyes. Let's just try um, just to actually do one thing. I'm gonna ask you to deliberately point a finger up to the ceiling. Just stick a finger up to the ceiling. And I'm going to ask you to notice how that feels. Now I'm going to ask you to let your finger go to the curl. And this is where I'm going to ask you to use imagination. So Hamid, you can actually start. I'll go slowly if you want to translate a little bit. But I, 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 don't, mind, I don't mind going slowly. But it's really important that I, I want you guys to look at your palm of the hand. And I want you to see the first finger. And I, I'm going to encourage you now to use imagination. This is where you get to be a child again. You can actually imagine that your first finger is attached to the sky. It's going up to the sky. And it's called a yeah. magic rope. So the magic rope is starting to lead the first finger up to the ceiling. And it's going knuckle by knuckle by knuckle, very slowly. And that first finger is being led by the magic rope up to the ceiling. So you need to keep your eyes focused here. Now, what, Hamid, I'm going to ask you, since you're the only one that um, can verbally speak, can you describe your um, experience? And you can please say this in Persian as well. Um, okay. from, from the first time you did that, when you first pointed it up, as opposed to using imagination and the magic rope. Okay, uh, at first uh, I will tell you my experience in uh, English, then I will translate your exercise, and uh, I will also translate my experience. Okay, is it okay? Yes. Okay, the first time that I uh, was for, uh, actually pointing to the ceiling, uh, because I have body awareness, it's a little bit different for me. Uh, there were a lot of contractions here and a pressure in my palm especially here in these uh, small muscles. And, uh, you know, I was unconscious about it, but when the second time I did it, I understood, okay, the first time was not a good one. Because uh, the second time, uh, when I was uh, watching it, I was imagining about it, uh, there was no pressure, and it was going up like, you know, uh, doing that was like a piece of cake. But the first time I was using a lot of pressure to do that. It was yes. my experience. Okay. Yes, yes. Wonder, that's actually one. That's usually the same thing that I have. Some people have an opposite. Some people say the second time is harder. Uh -huh. So everyone's experience is very different. I'm just going to say this one thing and then you can translate if you like. But it's that thought. It's the thought is what we call a kinesthetic imagination. And regardless what, whatever your experience is, it actually has a muscular effect. For me, the first time was lighter. Some people, it's like tougher, but it's the thought. It shows you how you can connect your mind to the body. It is one, it's not separate. You know, it, it, it's that thought, it's the kinesthetic imagination, which actually has a muscular effect. That's perfect. Yeah, if you want to translate maybe. Yes, that would be great. Uh, در بحره اول گفتش که فقط به صف اشاره کنید به این صورت من خب چون 
خیلی با آگاهی داشتم این تمرین رو انجام دادن داشتم شرایط مایچه های دستم و یک به یک بررسی میکردم در این تمرین ادی اولین بار من گفت به سمت بالا اشاره کنید من به صورت ناخداگاه وقتی اشاره کردم حس کردم که هم کشیدگی توی قسمت زیر انگشته اشاره دارم هم یه سری انقباز توی قسمت کف دستم دارم اینجا خب که این انقباز کشیدگی و این انقباز و کشیدگی توی ساعت هم حتی داشت تاثیر می‌کرد یعنی حسش می‌کرد بعد که ادی بهم گفت کف دستتو نگاه کن و حس کن که انگشتت با نخ بسته شده به سقف این آروم آروم داره اینو میاری بالا یعنی اون داری تصور میکنی بالا اومدن اینو در حین اینکه اینو داشتم من انجام میدادم احساس کردم وقتی که به همون حد رسیده انگشتم یعنی دفعه اولم تو همین حد صاف بود یعنی صاف بدون کشیدگی ما توی میز ماستر میگیم این صاف میگیم این کشیده است من در دو حالت داشتم صاف امتحان میکردم ولی دفعه دوم چون داشتم با این کینستتیک سنس هم میرفتم کشیدگی توی قسمت زیر انگوش کف دست بساید نبود داشتم خیلی نرم این کار انجام میدادم که در واقع من داشتم خیلی مانیتور میکردم این اتفاق رو یک به یک ولی حالا برای ادی میگه تجربه آدم مختلف متفاوت میگه من خیلی از اون اجوام دفعه اول صفت در دفعه دوم آزاد تر خیلی یا برعکسش دفعه اول خیلی آزاد میبرن دفعه دوم خیلی سفتش میبرن خب من دیگه طولانیش نمیکنم میرم سراغ ادی اوکی ادی وی ار اگین وید یو It's wonderful. No, of course. I think it's important because I want the, everybody to understand that even though I'm speaking to you in English, this work is another language within the language. So it needs to be translated into other languages so this way people can actually process this because it just takes time. And even people who speak English really don't understand this in the beginning and it takes time and there's nothing wrong with anybody it's just a matter of getting a concept into this and i am um, i am talking to you about the alexander technique and body mapping in conjunction without using my um, models of the skeleton and showing you pictures which i really wish i could but it we're, what we're doing now is use a tapping into our imagination which is also part of the alexander technique and body mapping called sensory awareness. Now I'm going to do something that's a little bit tricky and Hamid you can actually please know that I'm good with um if you speak in Persian I I can hear I can actually I understand when you're finishing. I I said okay. strange. I told you my mother's best friend is Persian. So like you know I grew, I grew up hearing. <laughs> They're like best friends and everything. So so but I can understand I'm like oh okay I understand. So but it's okay to interject you know because I do give presentations with you know whatever uh uh stopping but uh what i want to talk to you about now and, and again i don't unfortunately have a model of a spine i don't have a model of a head but the average weight of the head is about 10 to 15 pounds or about 6 kilos or less a little so that's a lot of weight that's on top of the spine but what i want to ask well because we don't have everybody's not in the same room i am going to ask you to point to where the top of your spine is uh, should i do that yes. because you have to know about it before yeah but it's good because i think it's going to shock a lot of people okay uh i personally believe is here right that's uh, what that, that's is here That's what a lot of people actually tend to believe. But the, the, the truth, this is where body mapping talks about the inner truth. The, what, what Hamid just did is everyone always points to this being the top of the spine. And the reality is the top of the spine is in between your ears and directly behind your nose. So just to give yourself, I know it's a lot of people are saying, what? So this is the element of three-dimensionality, three-dimensional. It's not one dimensional or one side. Um, it's three dimensional. And just to give yourself an idea of where the top of the tongue, uh, excuse me, where the top of the spine is, you can take your tongue and point it back towards your, the, the throat. Mm -hmm. And that's the direction of where the top of the spine is. So it's in the, it's more in the center. Now, re, um, Yes, the, the top vertebrae, yeah, yeah, the top vertebrae right there. Um, it's the, the skull, if you look at it from an anatomy, if you look at a picture from an, the anatomy, the skull is slightly forward of the, the spine. 
but it has every there's all these things with anatomic and anatomy and gravity and all these different things but that's why i love teaching with the actual bones the, well model bones not the real stuff but the the model bones or a picture and stuff like that because it really does clear things up but i said as i was just saying to you guys earlier and we're just going to go on sensation right now we're still going to we're going to uh be oh yes the uh, and it, the ao joint it forms a joint the atlantis occipital joint um and that goes on to the top vertebrae right there we're still okay, gonna... okay. Second, uh, the head of the spine is just in between yes we cannot touch it correct me if it's, if it's, if i'm not correct you you cannot touch it but you can point to it yes it's right? uh, exact middle from every side yes but three dimensional but it's not below it's not below the jaw like it's like you can literally actually go to, if you take your thumbs okay and they would be the level of your the top of the spine right uh -huh. you can go back because it's three dimensional yes we have this oh, okay that, i got it yeah so that okay. that it's a lot it's a lot higher than most people perceive pointing to here is actually your muscles and again this is where i'm very sad that i can't use the the um the the things but i'm just going to let you know that your you have neck muscles that drape down out to here you have neck muscles that go down to by the sternum and you actually have neck muscles that go about to about T12 of the spine all the way in the, lower in the back than they are in the front so it's again three dimensional and most people think that you know the the spine uh, the neck muscles are here it's a lot bigger so what mr alexander this, this is why he started losing his voice and what i'm going to ask you to do right now is to take two fingers everybody's going to take two fingers and you're going to um imagine using imagination that the the fingers are touching they're forming a metal rod right in the middle there and what you're going to do is pull your head back and down I'm going to ask you to pull your head back and down like this and you're going to say ah as in father and ah. notice how just try that again notice how that sounds and feels ah ah so that doesn't feel ah. really great so mr alexander discovered that to free the neck and now you know your neck muscles are a lot bigger usually i have the students draw right i i actually ask people to draw where the neck muscles are and stuff like that but because of time i'm just telling you um it this is this is really about self discovery but i'm giving you a little preview you know faster but remember where your neck muscles are and you're going to go back to here again and i'm going to say i'm going to ask you to use the power of your mind you're actually going to say you're going to say and allow yourself to free your neck muscles as your head rotates on that metal rod and i'm going to ask you to say ah oh now notice how that sounds and feels compared to the first right so your head is always being pulled because our neck muscles tend to be in a constant state of um contraction does that make sense so when yes. we are our neck well if we're playing if we're writing if we're doing something the, the neck muscles tend to be in a state of contraction which pulls down the head but if you actually free the neck muscles you can see how buoyant and fluid that they actually are which allows your head to be resting on top of the spine so yes when i was doing that i uh, uh you no know, uh, surprisingly i was uh, feeling some contractions even here and up to here i was you know in a really bad posture and it was killing me i was just thinking okay eddie let it go let it go i'm dying here exactly <laughs> But did you notice using the power of your mind you allowed that to rebalance on its own and then you allowed your spine to lengthen through that and then we could talk I mean another thing is we discover about what is the spine and how many parts of the spine and what's the spine made out of why is it why is it able to contract lengthen and contract because it's made out of vertebrae and discs and the discs okay. are made of Sorry to interrupt you. Please let us know of the importance of this alignment of the spine and the head. Why is it in the this much important? Well, it was actually discovered that being with without the ha having the contraction of the neck muscles. I will say very quickly, the neck muscles and the thigh muscles, the quads are the strongest muscles in the body for 
survival reasons or whatever, whatever that. So if the neck muscles are in a constant state of contraction, the head comes out of balance. And having the head in balance, I'm not talking that you have to walk around stiff like this all the time, but you always, you always have this buoyancy that's happening. You have your breathing, you have your spine lengthening and contraction, very little bit because it's coordinated with your breath. But being in a state of balance gets rid of D-I-E-A-S-E. -E. You know, like it, it gets rid of uncomfort or dis-ease. You're creating ease. You're, const you're always achieving. You're looking for that always. You're never stiffening yourself into a posture. That's why I talked about the, this is a re-education of your posture through movement and breathing. And discovering what the bones are and knowing that what the bones have a purpose and the muscles facilitate the purpose of the bones. So, and that's all you're just doing is just educating yourself. So this way you can actually use yourself much more um, efficiently. But I definitely want to give you, a, 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 you guys um, an exercise right now and we're going to write. And I'm going to ask you to take that paper or, and pen or pencil and I'm going to ask you to write your name. And um, you're gonna write your name like literally over and over. You're gonna write your name here and you're gonna write your name here over and over and over again. And it would be really good if you could do it on a flat surface, like on a, on okay. a yeah, if it's possible to uh, write on, start writing. So you guys can start writing your names and you're gonna write your name straight across until you get to the end and then you go to the next line. And just notice how that's feeling. You're writing okay. your first name, first and last name, first and last name, first and last name. Would you please give us a moment to translate it? Yes, please. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the name of 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 Yes. No, you're gonna you're gonna continue. It's gonna be continuous. You're gonna write your name over and over, and I'm gonna be okay. speaking to you. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. 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 Okay to the right side or left side, whatever, and then you're going back and forth and you're making rows and continue to write your names. And as you're writing your names, I'm gonna ask you to notice how that feels. Just, no, just only notice, I'm not asking you to adjust anything. But you know, now we're gonna use the sensory awareness. We're bringing that into the picture in, in conjunction with our kinesthetic sense. So as you're writing your name, I'm going to ask you to use your eyes as you're writing the name on the piece of paper. So you're looking down at the piece of paper as you're writing your name. And I want you to notice the four corners of the piece of paper as best as you can without straining. Mm -hmm. You're not straining, you're just writing your name and you're using your eyes just to see the four corners of the piece of paper. And as you're continuing to write your name whether that you're on a desk or on, writing on top of a book or anything, see if you can notice, if you can extend your eyes to see the four corners of the desk or whatever surface that you are writing on. Just to expand your eyesight a little bit more. And as you're writing and you're using your eyes and you're seeing the four corners of the piece of paper and the four corners of the table or surface that you're writing on, I want you to notice your breath. Notice your breath as you're writing. And as you're doing this activity, I want you to bring the awareness actually towards your hearing. Notice any sounds that might be in the room. There might be nothing. There just only be might be my voice. But just notice the sounds as you continue to write your name. So going back to your eyes, notice without strain, you're, you're just looking at the four pieces of the four corners of the piece of paper, the four corners of the table. Notice your breath and listening to your sounds, whatever sounds you can have. And then notice your legs. Are they crossed? 
Can you allow your feet to be on the floor? As you continue to write your name, you don't stop writing, you're continuously writing your name. And you're using your eyes as you're writing down and you're listening to the sounds around you and you're noticing your feet on the floor. And now I'm gonna ask you to imagine or sense what's behind you. Can you sense the wall? Whether that you looked at it or not, doesn't matter, but can you be aware of the space between you and the wall? And it's nothing that you have to memorize or know for sure, but it's just something that you should know that there's a wall behind you. Some of you might actually even have memorized that you might have a painting or a bookshelf or just a solid wall or a window, but notice your space behind you. As you continue to write your name, you're con you don't stop, you're constantly writing your name, constantly writing your name. And we go back to the beginning. We have our eyesight. You're looking down at the piece of paper and the four corners of the table. You notice your feet on the floor. You notice your breath. You're noticing the sound. And you have an inclusive awareness of behind you. What is behind you? What is the space? And as you're writing, notice your tactile touch, meaning how are you holding the pen or pencil at this point as you're writing the, your name over and over again? So you're always writing your name over and over and over and again, and you're listening to the instructions as I'm doing this. Notice your legs and notice your arms. Notice the space behind you, notice your breath and listening for the sound. Notice if your eyes are softer, maybe they're softer now. And with that, I'm going to ask you to stop writing your name and Hamid, I'm gonna ask you to share with the audience what your experience was, because everyone's experience is gonna be very different. Yes, uh, while I was doing that, uh, uh, when you were asking me, in fact, to focus on different parts, for example, the time that you told me, okay, focus on your legs, I understood that there are some contractions and uh, I'm not sitting in a really good uh, you know, way and my posture maybe is not good and uh, the balance was not good. I just changed. I know I was thinking uh, that I'm finding myself in my ankle. I mean, I was thinking about my ankle while I was singing and there was a lot of contractions and pressure there. So I just uh, let it go and when you were uh, telling me about your back, uh, the distance between my, uh, you know, the wall, of course, here is a bookshelf, and me. Uh, when I was thinking about that, I understood, okay, uh, I have contractions even here when I'm writing. And when you were asking me about uh, the pen, the pencil, mine is a pencil. Uh, I'm thinking, okay, why there's too much pressure here? And I'm just, you know, pressing the pencil to the uh, paper. Why? It's not needed. So I just let uh, let uh, the pressure go and uh, step by step, it, it was getting more and more difficult. But uh, uh, step by step, gradually I was understanding, okay, uh, I'm just uh, you know, getting easier and there's no contraction. I'm more free and I'm in a better posture. It was wonderful, especially the time that you told me, uh, you told me to uh, you know, go to your audience, uh, audience sense. That one was a wonderful. You know, uh, I suddenly understood, okay, uh, when I just listen to uh, the voices around me, my senses totally differ from the, uh, the time that I was you know, focusing on writing. It was my experience. That's wonderful. And can I ask you, just out of curiosity, did you feel yourself getting a little taller? Yes, yes, the yes. Especially the time that you asked me about my back, uh, I, I thought, okay, I'm getting a little bit uh, taller since, uh, you know, sometimes uh, at first, let me show you something. I was sitting like this, but in my mind, there was a big picture of me that was sitting like this. Yes. So it told me, okay, think of your back. Uh, I was just sitting like this, but there was a, another Hamid inside me that was like, I just let go of that one and I was really free. And I thought, okay, that's wonderful. I, I, that's really great. So within the body mapping and Alexander technique, the reason why I love to show where, where, where is the truth? Where are your neck muscles? It's a lot wider. They generally tend to be in a state of contraction. 
The head is heavy. Mm -hmm. If you free the neck muscles, your spine can lengthen and your head can go into balance. But when we just use this sensory awareness exercise, even with the academic um, discussion we just had, very small, we were just using the power of your mind. So that you recognize that if we tend to, whether we're playing an instrument, where we sit down in front of a computer, think of bakers, think of dentists, think of janitors actually, people who are sweeping all the time. We tend to contract, keep ourselves in a state of contraction where we forget about our breath, we forget about our awareness three-dimensionally, and we call this three uh, sensory awareness. And I bring it into like a lot from when people are playing because it's so important that if you speak to people and just say, hey, you have a three-dimensionality of you. Okay, here's the anatomy. We can talk about the anatomy, that's nice. But you don't have to memorize it. You should know that it exists. You should know your body parts from the skeleton to the musculature because we have a lot of connective tissue. And that just gets, you know, it's, it's fascinating if you would like that academic sort of thing. But for the average person, for the average musician, you know, when you're a conservatory student and you have to learn a concerto and you have to do scales and you have to do all these different types of things, you have a deadline, you throw all of that out the window. But I think it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. It's a duty to yourself. You have to think of yourself as an Olympic athlete. You have to think of yourself as someone who is gonna be treating your body well and you have to find ways. And that's what I love the work that you're doing because of the, the deep study that you're actually doing on an academic level and a neuroscience sort of thing. It's wonderful like, to do that. And I think that this is just a compliment. It just educating yourself and you're actually that little exercise we did with the writing, there's many more exercises actually. Yes. But like I said to you, go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, mean, I hope that, I hope that everybody. Uh, no, to hear uh, these words from a world-class musician like you, uh, I'm over the moon, okay? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, you mentioned about the breathing. Uh, that was a wonderful experience as well. When you told me to think of your breath, uh, I was, uh, you know, holding my breath intentionally. You know, and when you told me, I said, why? I'm just writing something. It must be really easy. It's not heavy. Uh, you know, the paper is closed. There's no need for too much pressure. Why, why am I holding my breath like this. I started to breathe easily and it was great. I'm happy that you had that. And I'm sure that if you speak to others that, you know, they'll share with you their, everyone's experience is personally different, but there's a commonality. There's something that's common that people say, I love the one uh, that um, comment is that they felt less pressure, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that it's just like, there's something that people get an experience with. I mean, I have, other imagination exercises to do. So you see with Alexander Technique and body mapping, it, there's an academic element You're using the power of the mind. When you work with an Alexander teacher, the teacher is actually putting hands on. It is not a massage. It's not meditation. It's just hands on that help you guide. We're, the hands of an Alexander teacher, we use the phrase, we're here to invite space. It's not to go digging in a massage. We're here, I'm placing my hands on the neck, head and torso region, and I'm inviting you to release the neck muscles so this way you can let your spine to lengthen so your head can rebalance, and it translates into your arms and your legs. And that, you know, that's what Mr. Alexander discovered. Think about it when he was alive, 1869 to, 19, uh, to uh, 1955. And this is before the internet and computer and everything like that. It was, he and Dr. Suzuki, as I told you guys in the very beginning, like people thought back then, it didn't matter where they were from. It's just really fascinating. This was kind of the time on the planet where there, there was great minds. And we're very lucky that we have this now, the legacy of that. Thank you. Eddie, I think that we are reaching the limited time of Instagram. It's one hour. Uh, is it okay if I end the live? save it and uh, start it again so we can continue talking? Yes, I'm more than happy because I know you have a bunch of questions. Yeah. Yes, I have to just look at here. <laughs> Two <big. laughs> I have a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, just uh, let me finish this one and uh, save it and I will call, uh, start it again, of course. Okay. Are there other questions? Uh, Yasan, please write this question. Uh, okay. We're gonna... Uh, no, my, my wife is here. She's gonna write it, don't worry. 
Okay, we're going to find a place. She will write it up. She will answer it at the end of the session. Okay. Uh, 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 it's in a conscious mantra. way, not an unconscious way. You're going to find the place of balance in your body consciously. You're, because we do things automatically that it goes into the unconscious. But think about when you started writing your name, that you were in a compressed state. That's an unconscious state. But, well, not lying down unconscious. I mean, like, you're not thinking about it. You're just going on automatic. But the consciously, you started to release and expand yourself. That's where you get balance, consciously, by engaging the power of your mind, actually. Yes. I hope that helps. Okay, okay thank you for your uh, answer. Uh, okay, I will end this one. Uh, everyone, please join us. We will uh, ask Eddie to join us in a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, because we are re reaching the limited of, uh, time of Instagram at IG Live. Uh, please join us. Uh, Eddie, I will add you again. Okay. See. Thank you. Could I have uh, 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 <laughs> I have to speak Persian as well. <laughs> okay. Okay. Dostan, we are in the one hour time of Instagram. We are going to live from there. I am going to keep the live on there. I am going to save it. یک دقیقه اینا فکر می‌کنم بیشتر زمان ببره دوباره لایو رو شروع می‌کنم ادی رو درخواست می‌کنم که بمون اضافه شو چون خیلی ازش سوال داریم خیلی انقدر دانش‌های مختلف و زمینه‌های مختلف داره من خودم دوست دارم یکی یکی راجبه این ازش بپرسم برای همین من قطع می‌کنم و دوباره ادامه می‌بینمتون سی یو اوکی